Hello, thank you all so much for joining me today to study A Course in Miracles workbook for students. We're reading from the original edition here on February the 12th of 2023, Lesson 43. God is my source. God is my source. I cannot see apart from Him. God is my source. I cannot see apart from Him. Kind of like yesterday, God is my strength. Vision is his gift. Well, God is my source. I cannot see apart from him. Perception is not an attribute of God. His is the realm of knowledge. Yet he has created the Holy Spirit as the mediator between perception and knowledge. Without this link with God, perception would have replaced knowledge forever in your mind. With this link with God, perception will become so changed and purified that it will lead to knowledge. That is its function as the Holy Spirit sees it. Therefore, that is its function in truth. <laughs> in God, you cannot see. Perception has no function in God and does not exist. Yet in salvation, which is the undoing of what never was, perception has a mighty purpose. Wow, removing the illusions. Yet in salvation, which is the undoing of what never was, perception has a mighty purpose. Made by the Son of God for an unholy purpose, it must become the means for the restoration of His holiness to His awareness. Perception has no meaning. Yet does the Holy Spirit give it a meaning very close to God's. Healed perception becomes the means by which the Son of God forgives his brother, and thus forgives himself. You cannot see apart from God because you cannot be apart from God. <laughs> whatever you do, you do in him because whatever you think, you think with his mind. If vision is real, and it is real to the extent to which it shares the Holy Spirit's purpose, then you cannot see apart from God. Three five-minute practice periods are required today. One as early as possible and another as late as possible, and the third may be undertaken at the most convenient and suitable time which circumstances and readiness permit. At the beginning of these practice periods, repeat the idea to yourself with eyes open. Then glance around you for a short time, applying the idea specifically to what you see. Four or five subjects for this phase of the exercise are sufficient. You might say, for example, God is my source. I cannot see this desk apart from him. And God is my source. I cannot see this picture apart from him. Although this part of the exercise period should be relatively short, be sure that you select the subjects for this phase indiscriminately, without self-directed inclusion or exclusion. For the second and longer phase of the exercise period, close your eyes, repeat today's idea again, and then let whatever relevant thoughts occur to you add to the idea in your own personal way. Thoughts such as, I see through the eyes of forgiveness. I see the world is blessed. The world can show me myself. I see my own thoughts, which are like God's. Or any thought related more or less directly to today's idea is suitable. The thoughts need not bear an obvious relationship to the idea, but they should not be in opposition to it. And of course, if you find yourself wandering and you're just thinking about all kinds of things, but not the lesson, well then say the lesson again and bring yourself back. God is my source. I cannot see apart from him. If you should find your mind wandering, if you begin to be aware of thoughts which are clearly out of accord with today's idea, or if you seem to be unable to think of anything, Open your eyes, repeat the first phase, and then try the second phase again. First phase being to close your, or open your eyes and say, uh, 
God is my source. I cannot see apart from him. And then and, and looking around saying, God is my source. I cannot see that elm tree apart from him or whatever you're seeing. And do that four or five times and close your eyes and say, uh, God is uh, God is my source. I cannot see apart from him. And um, and then think of and, and look at re relevant thoughts that occur and add the idea in your own personal way. Let whatever relevant thoughts occur to you uh, just come and, 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 and say them. And he gave some examples there. But if you find yourself wandering, start over is what he's basically saying. God is my source. I cannot see apart from him. Uh, if you should find your mind wandering, if you begin to be aware of thoughts which are clearly out of accord with today's idea, or if you seem to be unable to think of anything, open your eyes, repeat the first phase, and then try the second phase again. Do not allow any protracted period to occur in which you become preoccupied with irrelevant thoughts. Return to the first phase of the exercises as often as necessary to prevent this. In applying today's idea in the shorter practice periods, the form may vary according to the circumstances and situations in which you find yourself during the day. When you're with someone else, for example, try to remember to tell him silently, God is my source. I cannot see you apart from him. Of course, you could say that silently. You don't have to say it out loud. Though you could, I suppose. Depends on who it is, wouldn't it? This form is equally applicable to strangers and to those you know well. Try, in fact, not to make distinctions of this kind at all. Wow. Try not to make distinctions about people you know well. And what was the other term he used? Those you know well and strangers. Try not to even... We're all one. We're all brothers. You know, think, of, think of ourselves as all the same. Love, love everyone the way you love those you love the most, the family members that you have. Think of then everyone's family. Think of it that way. God is my source. I cannot see you apart from him, is what you might say. This form is equally applicable to strangers and to those you know well. Try, in fact, not to make distinctions of this kind at all. The idea should also be applied throughout the day to various situations and events which may occur particularly to those which distress you in any way. For this kind of application, use this form. God is my source. I cannot see this apart from Him. If no particular subject presents itself to your awareness, merely repeat the idea in its original form. God is my source. I cannot see apart from Him. Try today not to allow long periods of time to slip by without remembering today's idea and thus remembering your function. Okay, so there's what we'll be doing today. Let's go take a look in our text reading for today. We're ready for, uh, we're, we're in section, uh, we're, we're chapter 5, Healing and Wholeness, and we are in section 8, Time and Eternity, and we left off on paragraph, uh, at the end of paragraph 79. So we'll pick up there on paragraph 80. And he's he's been uh, giving us some ways of reinterpreting so that we don't let the ego uh, take control of our, our, our perceptions. We try to let the Holy Spirit uh, tell us what to see and how to see things, particularly when it comes to, the, he used several examples in the Bible. And we'll pick up there on paragraph 80 in a moment. Uh, I want to tell you about a cherry. Uh, we read all the peach, they had about, what, half a dozen peaches in edible landscaping. Well, there's some bush cherries, little bush cherries, small cherries. Well, one is the Cherapugi, I think it's Cherapugi, Mary, May Cherapugi, Nanking Red Bush cherry. It's a prunus, a prunus, <laughs> same as a peach genus, prunus tomentosa. And the cherapugi is northern European variety with large red fruit, big enough to be pitted with hand pitters, easier to process. 
pollinate with another Nanking cherry. Space six to eight foot apart, zones three through seven. Um, they're, they're a kind of a cold climate plant, but they, they do, do good here in the Ozarks. Okay, let's, uh, that's out of edibelandscaping.com, by the way. Okay, the eternal, uh, okay, paragraph 80. Appeal everything you believe gladly to God's own higher court, because it speaks for him and therefore speaks truly. It will dismiss the case against you, however carefully you have built it. The case may be foolproof, but it is not Godproof. <laughs> The voice for God will not hear it at all because he can only witness truly. His verdict will always be, thine is the kingdom, because he was given you to remind you of what you are. And thine is the kingdom. Um, I, that, that reminds me of Matthew 6. But um, you know, he, he is saying, thine is the kingdom. The, uh, Matthew 6, 13. Uh, paragraph 81, your patience with each other is your patience with yourselves. Your patience with each other is your patience with yourselves. Is not a child of God worth patience? I have shown you infinite patience, because my will is that our Father, from whom I learned of infinite patience, I have shown you infinite patience, because my will is that of our Father, from whom I learned infinite patience. That sounded a little better that time. <laughs> His voice was in me as it is in you, speaking for patience towards the sonship in the name of its creator. What you need to learn now is that only infinite patience can produce immediate effects. This is the way in which time is exchanged for eternity. Infinite patience calls upon infinite love. And by producing results now, it renders time unnecessary. Well, that's, that's miracle-mindedness. Paragraph 82. To say that time is temporary is merely redundant. We have repeatedly said that time is a learning device which will be abolished when it is no longer useful. The Holy Spirit who speaks for God in time also knows that time is meaningless. He reminds you of this. He reminds you of this in every passing moment of time because it is his special function to return you to eternity and to remain to bless your creations there. He is the only blessing you can truly give because he is so truly blessed and because he has been given you to so freely, let's read that again, I messed that up. He is the only blessing you can truly give, because he is so truly blessed. And because he has been given you so freely by God, you must give him as you received him. <laughs> yeah, we got it right there, didn't we? Okay, in the next section, the eternal fixation. And... Uh, the idea of set is among the better psychological concepts. Okay, let's see if we can... I think I've got a definition for set. Uh, in psychology, a set is a group of expectations that shape experience by making people especially sensitive to specific kinds of information. A perceptual set, also called perceptual expectancy, is a predisposition to perceive things in a certain way. And I find that I found that on Wikipedia. Uh, let's see what else. I think I had another. Did I have another? Oh yeah, a mental set refers to the tendency to stick with the most familiar solution to a problem and stubbornly ignore alternatives. Found that on frontiersin.org. And you know, that whole idea that we, when it says that we stick, we, we stick with most familiar solution to a problem and stubbornly ignore alternatives, I'd call that closed-mindedness. 
or being set in your ways. That'd be a nice way to look at it. We don't want to be that way. We want to be open-minded. And he tells us that open-mindedness is generally one of the latter characteristics that a teacher of God develops. So let's be aware that we want to develop that, that open-mindedness so that we can see the power of forgiveness in every moment where we were we were kind of shut down and we our set caused us to judge. But now it's we, we step back and we were, we're sensing the feeling of, of judgment, uh, uh, the loss of joy, the loss of peace. And we think to ourselves, oh, I may have thought that God wouldn't think. wonder what I just did. I must be set in my ways. I think I'm going to open my mind and find a miracle, find a new way of perceiving. <laughs> okay, the idea of set is among the better psychological concepts. Actually, it is used quite frequently in the Bible and also in this course under many different terms. For example, God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him or set on him. That's out of Isaiah 26, 3, favorite Bible verse of mine. God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is set or stayed on him. A statement which means that God's peace is set in the Holy Spirit because it is fixed on God. It is also fixed in you. You then are fixed in the peace of God. The concept of fixation is also a very helpful one, which Freud understood perfectly. Unfortunately, he lost his understanding because he was afraid, and as you know all too well, fear is in compatible with good judgment. Fear distorts things and therefore disorders thought. So let's look at what the, the definition of fixation would be. And uh, in Freud's, um, I found this on uh, Purdue, uh, you know, Purdue.edu, fixation, uh, in Freud's definition of fixation, when one's desire is tied to an object of desire, connected to an earlier phase in one's psychosexual development. Also, I found this on CollinsDictionary.com, fixation, to think about a particular subject or person to an extreme and excessive degree. Okay, so to be fixated on something. So he's saying that can be a, a, something we can, that we can use both good and bad. Freud's system of thought was extremely ingenious because Freud was extremely ingenious. <laughs> and a mind must endow its thoughts with its own attributes. This is its inerrant strength, although it may misuse its power. Freud lost much of the potential value of his thought system because he did not include himself in it. This is a dissociated state because the thinker cuts himself off from his thoughts. Freud's thought was so conflicted that he could not have re retained his sanity as he saw it without dissociation. That is, that is why the many contradictions which are quite apparent in his thinking became increasingly less apparent to him. A man who knows what fixation really means and yet does not yield to it is terribly afraid. 85. Fixation is the pull of God on whom your mind is fixed because of the Holy Spirit's ir irrevocable set. Now he's using it in quite a, a, a new, more of a metaphysical way, I would call it. But, but you know, from a, from a, a spiritual context, I guess Fixation is the pull of God on whom your mind is fixed because of the Holy Spirit's irrevocable set. Irrevocable, mean, irrevocable means cannot be called back or redirected. The irrevocable nature of the Holy Spirit's set is the basis for his unequivocal voice. The Holy Spirit never changes his mind. Clarity of thought cannot occur under conditions of vacillation. Unless a mind is fixed in its purpose, it is not clear. Clarity literally means the state of light, and enlightenment is understanding. Enlightenment stands under perception, because you have denied it as the real foundation of thought. This is the basis for all delusional systems.
Wow, enlightenment stands under perception because you have denied it as the real foundation of thought. This is the basis for all delusional systems. 86. The concept of fixation as Freud saw it has a number of learning advantages. First, it recognizes that man can be fixated as at a point in development which does not accord with a point in time. This clearly could have been a means toward real release from the time belief had Freud pursued it with an open mind. Freud, however, suffered all his life from refusal to allow eternity to dawn upon his mind and enlighten it truly. Wow. Let's not, let's not do that. Let's not let that be said of us. Freud, however, suffered all his life from refusal to allow eternity to dawn upon his mind and enlighten it truly. As a result, he overlooked now entirely and merely saw the continuity, continuity of past and future. 87. Second, although Freud misinterpreted what the Holy Spirit told him, or better reminded him of, he was too honest to deny more than was necessary to keep his fear in tolerable bounds as he perceived the situation. So he was an honest man, best he could, best he could there, huh? Therefore, he emphasized that the point in development at which the mind is fixated is more real to itself than the external reality with which it disagrees. This, again, could have been a powerful release mechanism had Freud not decided to involve it in a strong defense system because he perceived it as an attack. In 88, or the third, third thing, Although Freud interpreted fixation as involving irrevocable danger points to which the mind could always regress, the concept can also be interpreted as an irrevocable call to sanity which the mind cannot lose. Freud himself could not accept this interpretation, but throughout his thought system the threat of fixation remained and could never be eliminated by any living human being. Essentially, this was the basis of Freud's pessimism, personally as well as theoretically. He tried every means his very inventive mind could devise to set up a form of therapy which could enable the mind to escape from fixation forever, even though he knew this was impossible. <laughs> and the last paragraph we'll read today, 89, this knowledge plagued Freud's belief in his own thought system at every turn because he was both an honest man and a healer. He was therefore only partially insane and was unable to relinquish the hope of release even though he could not cope with it. The reason for this amount of detail is because you are in the same position. You are eternally fixated on God in your creation and the pull of this fixation is so strong that you will never overcome it. The reason is perfectly clear. The fixation is on a level so high that it cannot be surmounted. You are always being pulled back to your creator because you belong to him. <laughs> That's some good fixation. Okay, let's go take a look now at our, uh, uh, let's, uh, just a quick reminder. God is my source. I cannot see apart from him. We're going to start our lesson by looking around and saying, to four or five items. God is my source. I cannot see this leaf apart from him. I, can, I cannot see them. You do that for several things. Then close your eyes. And it says, uh, close your eyes. Repeat today's idea. God is my source. I cannot see apart from him. And then let whatever relevant thoughts occur to you. Add the idea in your own personal way. And, and then... Uh, and then if you find yourself wandering, go back to the beginning again and start over. But keep use that. I like to think of it as the idea for the day. It's kind of a guardrail to keep me centered in what is important. God is my source. I cannot see apart from him. And then throughout the day, as you meet people, say to them, God is my source. I cannot see you apart from him. Of course, don't say that out loud. Just say it under your breath, you know. 
and uh, and then throughout the day think of uh, God as my source I cannot see this if anything distresses you for sure use that God is my source I cannot see this whatever apart from him God is my source I cannot see apart from Him God is my source I cannot see apart from Him God is my source I cannot see this whatever apart from Him God is my source I cannot see apart from him and of course you'll do this for about five minutes three times today and then you'll want to be sure that you uh, take it with you all through the day saying it often particularly if you're distressed say God is my source I cannot see this apart from him and when you meet someone say God is my source I cannot see you apart from Him. God is my source. I cannot see apart from Him. God is my source. I cannot see apart from Him. So take that with you today. Do the best you can at keeping it in your mind throughout the day, God is my source. I cannot see apart from Him.